Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Ron Vale. I'm the executive director of Genelia Research Campus. And I'd like to welcome you to a very special evening uh, with our guest and a very good friend of mine, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. And I'd also like to uh, extend a warm welcome to uh, many of you from the local Loudoun County uh, community who are here in person and also watching virtually uh, through the Loudoun County Public Library. So um, warm welcome to you as well, and I hope you enjoy the evening. So I'll keep my opening remarks relatively short, but I want to provide some background of uh, John's work um, uh, in preparation for our conversation. So uh, John originally trained as a scientist. He obtained his PhD in molecular biology at MIT, working in the lab of Nobel laureate uh, Salvador Luria. Uh, and then John trained as a postdoctoral fellow at UMass Medical Center, uh, working with Dr. Rob Singer, who many of you uh, know here at Genelia because he's had a long-term uh, research affiliation with us. And it's a great pleasure to have Rob and his wife, Amy, here tonight in the audience. So beyond molecular biology, John also developed other interests during his PhD, uh, namely the investigation of the human mind and the human condition. And after studying um, millennial old teachings and practices uh, from Eastern traditions, John had a vision of bringing practices of mindfulness to the West. Uh, initially to help those facing uh, physical and emotional challenges and who are falling through the cracks of the medical system. And John saw, John saw an opportunity to empower patients, indeed any individual, with the tools that gave them agency to meet whatever condition they may be facing at that time in their life. Uh, and then in 1979 at UMass Medical Center, John developed an intensive and structured eight-week program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. I may refer to it also as MBSR. And this program, um, as you might imagine, was quite a radical idea at that time. But it was really a brilliant synthesis of uh, John's deep understanding of the timeless wisdoms of the human mind, combined with his scientific understanding of how to develop a rigorous protocol that could be replicated by others and also evaluated. And replicated and studied, it has been. So uh, aided by his later book, uh, Full Catastrophe Living, MBSR is now being offered um, in close to its original form in over 700 hospitals and academic centers worldwide. And in fact, attending this evening, we have a couple of directors from the NIH who fund uh, programs and research in mindfulness and two physician scientists from Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School who offer MBSR programs to their patients and also do research in MBSR. So we welcome you as well. And beyond uh, medicine, John's work has been transformative in bringing mindfulness to the broader awareness uh, of the West along with other early pioneers such as Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, Jack Cordfield, and others. But if you transport yourself back in time to the 1970s, the word mindfulness was virtually unknown in the West and practices of meditation were uncommon. And now that has dramatically changed as I think we'll uh, cover in our dialogue. And what John did so skillfully was to find the right language to introduce mindfulness within the cultural framework of the West, where the core truths that resonate with all human beings were highlighted without necessarily the trappings of religions or beliefs. And he did this through skillful talks, leading practices in person and online, and writing 14 books, uh, two of which you've received this evening. And finally, I wanna offer uh, my own personal reflections uh, about John. And maybe I'll even compare it to our science. So in Genelia, uh, we think about different scales of biology. We think about how uh, molecules uh, get together to create cells and how cells cooperate with one another to form organisms. And John similarly thinks deeply about all scales of the human experience. John is deeply compassionate uh, for the individual. And one of his founding statements for MBSR is, no matter what your circumstance may be, 
there is more right with you than wrong. And in John's presence, with his deep compassion and wisdom, an individual can experience and really understand the deep truth of this. And he also thinks at a bigger scale of what needs attention and needs healing at any given moment, as exemplified by his leading a series of 66 virtual mindfulness uh, sessions between March and June of 2020 during the pandemic, which was uh, listened to by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And as we'll explore in our conversation, John is also proactive and well-spoken about why we humans, us homo sapiens, must embrace, must involve, evolve to more awareness, more wisdom, more compassion, at a time when the welfare of this planet and the health of our society is calling to us. And we can no longer afford not to listen, no longer afford not to take such a path forward. John, it is a true honor uh, to have you here this evening at Genelia. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a very warm welcome to Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. Thank you. Well, John, uh, first of all, let me just to say uh, what an honor it is for you to come here. And um, even if I can speak from my heart, it is, um, I deeply appreciate and am grateful for every time we have a chance to talk, whether it's uh, on our deck at the, in Massachusetts or here in this audience, audience uh, you know, sharing our conversation with many people here today. And um, I also want to tell our audience that uh, John is uh, staying here for a second day and leading a retreat, a full day retreat on mindfulness in science. And during that day, we're going to explore the um, intersection between the practices of mindfulness and the practices of science. And I think that should be a really enlightening, certainly very unusual uh, uh, day. So. Uh, John, thank you so much for spending this time with us. My pleasure, Ron. It's really wonderful to be here and uh, to bathe in the experience. I've already met with a number of people for several hours that work here and just to bathe in the physical plant and the entire experience and then the sense of welcome and now all of us here together. Hi, Erica. So... um, Thank you for your welcome, and I would say, you know, I feel extremely welcome here and um, really interested in how this evening is going to unfold. Yeah, I should say, we have not uh, shared information about the question, so, you know, this evening is really going to be a conversation with us and with all of you, and, um, you know, as John likes to say, it will be unfolding moment by moment by moment. Um, so we'll see where it takes us. But, um, John, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start, if I could, uh, how I started the conversation with our other dialogue uh, speakers here, which is really at the beginning, like talking about um, your childhood, your upbringing, um, you know, the people who were important to you in your life and um, what, how that early background um, framed who you are. So I will say, I don't have many slides, but I will show you one. Um, and, um, oh, my and, God. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very interesting. You do so, your research. Yeah, so first of all, uh, John's father was uh, Elvin, Elvin Cabot, and um, um, that Dr. Cabot was a distinguished immunologist at uh, Columbia He was a member of the National Academy of Science, and he won a very prestigious uh, award called the National Medal of Science. And your mother uh, uh, was an artist, so she uh, drew these portraits that you see here and uh, these beautiful pictures. But, um, you know, where I'd like to begin is you grew up in this environment of both science and art. And um, I'd love for you to share, like, how that shaped your, who you are and uh, what you became. Wow. Uh, I love that this is unfolding in real time and completely unscripted. (laughs) (coughs) Uh, Because uh, 
Yeah, I grew up in a very unusual family, but you know, as we all realize when we're growing up, that all families are unusual uh, in very unusual ways, and so it just seemed very ordinary to me at the time. But but I grew up in what, what C.P. Snow in the 1950s, a great uh, British historian and philosopher, uh, called the two cultures. Uh, my father's culture of science. And and you have to picture, I grew up on Haven Avenue <clears throat> in uh, Washington Heights, which curves around and becomes 168th Street. And so my apartment building and actually my window in my bedroom looked out on Bard Hall, which is the medical student dorm. So I was kind of practically born into the medical school. And then there was uh, several other buildings, and then my father's laboratory. And over the course of 50 or 60 years, he moved his laboratory to three of the four buildings on that corner, 168th Street and 4, 4 Washington Avenue. And he was very uh, active in science and had a, just a, a global community of people who were, um, I guess you could say, exploring the um, the miracle of uh, the uh, our ability to, you know, develop antibodies and and uh, uh, resist disease or fight disease in a certain way. And he, you know, sort of studied that all the way down to the level of the amino acid sequences of antibodies and then their uh, their genetic code and how they fold. Uh, so, so I grew up with a father who was totally into that and spent his entire life in the lab. Uh, and then my mother, completely unknown, had no following, no c- community, but she was like, loved painting. She saw the world like a painter and i and i and i and i saw it through her eyes she kind of taught me that she would see things that i later began to say that's a, that's a lot like monet he saw she saw reflections in glass and she would paint them and all sorts of different kinds of things and and it was so i grew up in this household where there was like science and then there was art and she was also a flautist so it was music too and they took me to the uh, <clears throat> Museum of uh, Modern Art every Saturday and put me from the age of five, put me in school there. There was a little school for children, Museum of Modern Art. So, and I made an elephant, I think, at age five. I still have that elephant in my basement. It's the last artistic thing I've ever done. <laughs> so, but there was one interesting thing which I've never really talked about in public uh, and will only say so much about here, but at least hint at the fact that my father, although he would go to the museums, and my, he had no appreciation for either visual or musical art. And I could see that when I was five years old, and it just got more apparent as I got older. And my mother... I mean, just understanding what you would now call molecular immunology was like, you know, it was like. So as a child, I began to somehow intuit (coughs) that they lived in different realms of knowing. And I somehow felt like there's got to be some way that these two realms of knowing converge, that they're, they're different aspects of the human mind and heart expressing itself. And of course, I never would have been able to articulate, but when, articulate that, but when I was at MIT uh, in the uh, mid 60s, right before the Gulf of Tonkin incident uh, that uh, triggered the, our, our participation in the endless Vietnam war, um, I I happened to uh, be walking along a corridor and I saw a sign on the wall. At MIT, the corridors are like the Pentagon. They just go on forever. I saw a sign on the wall saying, The Three Pillars of Zen, talked by Philip Kaplow at the invitation of Houston Smith. 
I didn't know who Philip Kepler was. I didn't know who Houston Smith was. And I didn't know uh, what Zen was. But I went to that talk. Uh, and uh, and four other pe- three other people went to that talk besides the speaker and the person that invited him. It was like, it was not, the room was not full. And I was 21 years old at the time. And he was talking about exactly... When he was talking about meditation, when he was talking about Zen and his own experience of having been a journalism student at Columbia and then uh, being at, uh, covering the, uh, the war trials tribunal, uh, the war crimes tribunal at Nuremberg, um, after taking in what happened in Nuremberg, he went off to a Zen monastery. He just couldn't live with himself anymore. He went off to a Zen monastery in Hokkaido, Japan, the northernmost island, freezing cold, no heat. And, uh, and then he, he actually uh, reported on his chronic uh, headaches went away. His chronic bowel stuff went away. He, he's like, he's, he felt like he became himself. So... Um, I'm listening to this at 21 years old and realizing that's exactly what I'm looking for. My whole life, which was 21 years old at that time. My whole life I've been looking for. So I started meditating that day uh, because Kaplo gave us a little guidance in it. He was a kind of American Zen master, you'd call him. He, the book, The Three Pillars of Zen, is a total classic. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend you reading it, actually, right now at this stage of things. Uh, so I started meditating that day. And like I started a lot of things in my youth that I didn't last as long as I thought they would. But I'm still meditating. And because there was a way in which that intuition that would unify uh, different ways of knowing turned out to be satisfyingly uh, true in my case at least and I felt like it gave me back my life in a certain way that before that I was just trying to find out who I was and the meditation helped me to realize that uh, maybe it's actually better to not try to qu- too quickly put yourself in a box of some narrative about who you are but to continually inquire into who you are and the nature of human experience, the nature of embodied wakefulness, the nature of the human mind, the, the, the miracle of even, and the mystery of having a body. And then the fact that, as you were alluding to, the body doesn't of, always uh, just make things totally copacetic. I mean, we, we have stress, pain, illness, disease, and disease on top of that. And of course, that's true at the individual level of the body. It's true in families. It's true in society. And you can see how true it is globally just by reading the newspaper on a moment-by-moment basis now. And then there's also the pain and suffering of knowing that collectively with how clever we are as homo sapiens, uh, we've managed to give the planet a fever that has the potential to run wild and not be stoppable. So that's kind of a lot to take in. Uh, but that's basically, uh, since, you, since you set me up this way, uh, one of an infinite number of historical narratives, none of which are exactly true, that led to this moment. Oh, well, that's wonderful, John. So I, I, I would soon like to get maybe to this next transition in in your life, which was how you started um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, Before we go there, and since you already brought up the topic of Zen and meditation, and um, uh, maybe now is a good moment, actually, to um, have a conversation with the audience about what mindfulness is. Um, uh, You know, it's a word right now that is widely used, and not, uh, in many cases, understood. Um, so maybe this is a, a great moment to discuss mindfulness. And also, if you want to 
engage with the audience and what that is experientially uh, beyond words, uh, feel free to go well, let, let me just ask for a show of hands. Um, first of all, if you don't mind, and if you do, don't raise your hand. But how many of you would say that in one form or another, you have a fairly regular meditation practice of one kind or another? Raise your hands up high so I can feel them in the room. And look around uh, just to see that, you know, uh, that's, I don't know, maybe 20% of the audience, 15%, 20%. If we'd asked that question 50 years ago, there'd be 0%. Something is happening. I mean, the bell curve of society is moving in many, many ways. But one of the ways that is happening is that what used to be considered the far side of the lunatic fringe... Okay, like a meditator is like you're uh, an imbecile, you know. I mean, it's like voodoo, not so. Uh, and now all of a sudden, uh, maybe people think, oh, meditation, maybe, maybe I could use a little of that. You know, of course, I still don't know what it is, but, but uh, so, so there is this kind of shift that kind of uh, in society where at least our society and European society and South American society. This is a kind of a global movement. And even in Asia, uh, Asians are now starting to use the word mindfulness in Chinese in particular uh, because a lot of it like, has been very religiously based in formalisms that are not what meditative awareness is really about. Uh, and so there's kind of like been a kind of renaissance in, in China and in India and in uh, various places. And now in interfacing of these ancient, as you were suggesting in your introduction, ancient meditative traditions with modern science and medicine and psychology and well-being and neuroscience. And just to throw in, uh, how many of you in the audience are neuroscientists in one way or another or cognitive scientists? Raise your hands up high so I can, again, feel. So, you know, uh, there was a whole generation of uh, graduate students, maybe 10 years younger than I was, still am, uh, still 10 years younger, but back when they were in graduate school, and they would go to their thesis advisors and say, I want to do my thesis on uh, mindfulness or meditation. And the usual response was, that's a career-ending move. Now, these young neuroscientists, they started meditating way before they got into graduate school. So they knew what it was that they were interested in. And now, I mean, people don't bat an eye with neuroscience uh, merging with mindfulness because you can ask a whole range of very interesting questions and then get some kind of readouts and answers by putting people in fMRI machines and, and, and looking in real time and, and making very interesting discoveries. For instance, just to riff on this one little bit, if you put somebody in uh, an fMRI scanner and you tell them not to do anything, to just relax, don't do anything, this midline region of the frontal cortex just goes insane with activity. And that's called the default mode network, uh, DMN, the default mode network. And when you interrogate or investigate, what are people doing? They're lying in the scanner. They're told to do nothing. There's no protocol. You just, like, lie there. What, what do you think they're doing? They're, they're perseverating in one way or another on the most interesting person in the world, me, myself, moi, and the story of me, and what a shitty day I had, or how fabulous my this is, or my that is. So that there's this constant stream of thinking and activity that's measurable in this default mode network that uh, never stops. And it's generating story after story, success, failure, no good, you know, worries, and, and sometimes it's like, it's like a plague. You can't shut it off, can't go to sleep. 
uh, if your life is very, you know, stressful or challenging in various ways, that just goes bananas. And so, <clears throat> and now there are all sorts of studies in the scanner of people who have been meditating for, you know, extended periods of time where they actually see complete shutdown of those regions of the brain. But if you try to make it happen, it doesn't happen. So one of the key elements of meditative awareness is it's not about getting someplace else. We're trying to fix or reduce or attenuate anything. It's about embracing the actuality of things and letting things be. And then all of a sudden, this whole network of I, me, and mine shuts down. And you, when people experience that, they experience they'll usually say things like, I had a moment of peace. A moment of peace. And very often with moments of peace comes insight. Deep insights of like, you know, I've been driving myself crazy for years for no reason. <laughs> things like that. And uh, it feels liberative. So um, that's a kind of very small encapsulation of how these, these worlds converge, but then actually people find it beneficial to engage in a practice that from the outside looks a lot like nothing. And it just goes on forever. You'll get bored and go home and I'll still be sitting here (laughs) doing absolutely nothing. Uh, Only I shouldn't use the verb to do, it's more a being. So being without striving to attain or achieve a particular state Okay, this will get neuroscientists all agitated because it's all about states, but there's no mindful state. Uh, But there are many different conditions of the mind. They're constant, very dynamic. And so when you learn to access your own awareness, which you already have, so you're not going to get rid of it, uh, and you don't need to attain anything, you already have awareness, but access to it That has to be learned in most cases. So then, all of a sudden, you have new degrees of freedom in your life because you don't have to believe the narratives that you're telling yourself. And that's very freeing. And that comes with a lot of emotional baggage, too, that can disappear. And that's the heart of MBSR, really. I mean, I've described it in a way I ordinarily wouldn't, but uh, trying to make it more personal in this kind of environment. But, uh, but uh, the heart of MBSR is to take people falling through the cracks of the healthcare system, as you said, and challenging them to just see as a proposition. We're not saying it's true. Is there anything that you can do for yourself that nobody on the planet, no matter how much they love you, can do for you? And just see if that's, uh, that would help in collaborating with the healthcare system to... Um, live the life that's yours to live optimally as best you can over whatever period of time you have, starting from the only moment you ever can start, and that is called now. And so that's, that's, that's how it came to be. Well, maybe I can uh, build on a few things you said, John. So um, um, you don't have to be in an fMRI machine to like understand the nature of the mind. No, you don't. And Better if you're not. Yeah. So um, maybe you could talk about that, but as, just as a framing, you know, what uh, we do as scientists, first of all, is uh, observe the natural world. At Genelia, we have uh, lots of very fancy, expensive microscopes uh, to do that. And then we, when we observe something in the natural world, we also, as scientists, then, um, you know, find ways to interrogate it further, try to understand the truth of nature and so forth. So, um, you know, in the case of mindfulness, as I said, that that was developed a long time, you know, before there were any microscopes. And also in science, we're quite far away from, you know, converting any of these observations of the brain of neurons into, you know, these bigger concepts that we all experience, you know, what is consciousness? What what is our mind doing? So maybe you can extend a little bit about uh, mindfulness as a form of investigation that you can do yourself uh, to investigate your own mind 
and even maybe compare it and contrast it a little bit with uh, with science uh, as an observational activity. Yeah, it, it, it is. That's a really wonderful point that you're making is that it is an investigation. Um, sometimes in some traditions, it's, it's just uh, asking a particular question and then observing what comes. And the, the key question would be, who am I? Uh, and so if you just were to, you know, take a posture like this and, and just sit and ask yourself, who am I? What usually would arise is like the story of me, just as what I was alluding to, my name, my age, my, my you know, all my adventures. But then you realize that that's just a narrative, that's just a kind of... So, at a certain point, you're going to run into a very powerful uh, wall, so to speak. Uh, and that is that maybe the most honest answer is, I don't know. Who am I or what am I? Is not, I don't know. Well, that not knowing, I mean, that's the heart of scientific inquiry, right? The trouble, you know, you have to be willing to hold everything that you know and then be in not knowing long enough to have some kind of insight that is very often impossible to explain that puts things together in a way that no one on the planet has seen before. We don't actually understand how that kind of creative insight or imagination or whatever we want to call it, but it's beyond thinking. It's called direct, it's kind of more like a direct app perception. So there's a certain way in which, um, let's just say um, you were interested in, how many of you would be interested in actually having a, a short gu- period of guided meditation where I just guide you and, see, and just play with it? I mean, just this is not the kind of indoctrination of some kind, but just, you know, it's like I don't know what you're being, indo- being indoctrinated into. But, you know, just to play with the sort of, because our lives are so dominated by thinking and by emotional reactivity and by liking and disliking and pursuing what we want and pushing away what we don't want. It's like constantly, you know, intention of one kind or another. What would it be like to just now um, take a moment and uh, first of all, notice how I'm sitting the chairs are not the greatest, but yeah, you see, notice everybody's moved. I didn't say anything about moving, but all of a sudden, because, you know, usually we sit back. We use the back of the chair to, like, hold us in maximal comfort. But what about sitting in a posture that embodies a certain kind of autonomy? That imagine, like, the chair were kicked out from under you. You'd have a chance to actually not just collapse. Okay? And... It, and then um, you, you don't need to close your eyes, but you're welcome to if you want. I mean, you, eyes open, eyes closed. Meditation would not be, or mindfulness would not be very useful if you could only do it with your eyes closed. So um, to just feel the feet flat on the floor, okay? Some kind of grounding. And feel uh, your bottom supported by the chair and the spine elevating vertebra by vertebra out of the pelvis which it does, and it's kind of amazing that we can do this in the gravitational field. And then the head is kind of balanced on the cervical spine. And then just do something comfortable with your hands. And bring awareness to the body as a whole sitting here. And noticing that you can do that like that. I mean, you can just bring awareness to the entire proprioceptive universe of this body sitting right here in this moment. And of course, there's a certain kind of soundscape. Even if I stop talking, so there's hearing going on. And you can bring awareness to that hearing. 
and then it becomes, in a certain sense, apprehended in a in a, in a moment by moment way, without thinking about blowers or naming where the sources of the sounds are or liking it or wishing it would go away, but just apprehending hearing. So this is mindfulness of sound and the silence underneath sound. Notice also, also as well that, and anybody who this is not true for, I'm going to make a wild assumption here, but anybody who's not true for, come and, not, come and see me afterwards. I'm making the assumption that everybody in this room is exchanging air with the room. It's called breathing. And rather than thinking that you're breathing, because if it was up to you to keep the breath going, you would have died ages ago. You're very unreliable. But there is breathing going on. The body is breathing. or being breathed. And can you feel the whole sensory field of the body breathing, wherever those sensations are most predominant? And can you notice that uh, while we're feeling the breath and attending to the breath or riding with full awareness on the waves of the breath, this is very different from thinking about the breath. We're actually directly experiencing the the sensations associated with breathing. And that that doesn't diminish one bit what the ears are taking in. You can expand the field of awareness to actually include both the breath sensations and sounds. Notice that that's possible. And in a similar way, if we sit here long enough, you'll begin to notice that uh, your mind is not attending to the breath sensations in the body at all. You're wondering when the hell I'm going to stop. Or something's itching and it's driving you crazy. Or you have one thought or another about the infinite better possibilities you could have chosen for this evening if only you had some modest way of wiggling out between all these rows. And that's called thinking. And so whatever arises in the, in the world of thought, again, awareness can hold it. Notice, oh, that's just a thought. Liking and disliking the thoughts. And see if you can just be the awareness itself. So that all of this arising and lingering and passing away, whether it's in the sensory domain in the body, with, associated with the breath or any other regions of the body that may or may not be uh, entering into your awareness, or the soundscape, or the... Uh, what do you call the thoughtscape, the mindscape, thoughts and emotions, narrative, past and future, memory, anticipation, worry. Just seeing them all as arisings and passings away in the field of awareness, like waves on the surface of the ocean, just coming and going. And you don't have to operate on them at all, just... embracing them in awareness, and it's almost as if the awareness does all the the embracing by itself. So there's no place you have to go, there's nothing you have to be good at, 
There's no special something that you're trying to attain. But you're actually inviting awareness itself in some very real way to become your default mode, at least for this timeless moment we call now. Before the mind gets distracted and falls into thinking once again. So when the mind wanders, you notice what's on your mind, and then bring it back to your body, to the belly, to the breath, to whatever object you care to attend to if you're attending to objects, or resting in the boundless spaciousness of human awareness as your kind of default mode or home base. And then if your eyes have been closed, I invite you to open them, but without losing the sense of moment-to-moment awareness. Grounded in the body, in the air, in hearing what's being said. And so you'll notice I didn't... uh, ring some bells and say, okay, now we're going to meditate. I'm not ringing any bells now to say that now the meditation is over. Because if you understand what I'm trying to point out to you, is that that there is no beginning and no end to the meditation practice as I'm defining it here. That life itself is the real meditation practice. And part of the challenge is, how much of it are you going to be present for or are you going to miss because you're lost in the th- thought and in your own story of me and the narrative and the past and the future and this timeless, precious, timeless present moment. Like, so this has infinite, you can see infinite uh, uh, value in terms of relationships. I mean, how many times do the people you love the most maybe said, you, you know, earth calling grandpa or whatever it is, you know, because grandpa's out to lunch. Or, you know, that that we are so distractible and so lost in our own self-centeredness that we forget how multifaceted and multidimensional and beautiful in our wholeness, W-H-O-L, which is the root meaning of the word health, you know, healing and holy, actually. And it's all right here in this moment. So that's that's a kind of brief introduction to the meditation practice. Uh, It will just become a a nice or totally boring, if you felt it was totally boring, uh, memory, unless you remember that, oh, here's another moment of now. It's all just moments of now. Whether you're working with an electron, looking through, or I don't know, you don't look through electron microscopes, I guess, in the usual way, but no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're doing, you can bring awareness to it. And it adds a, a, what I sometimes describe as a kind of orthogonal dimension to things, because it's like the reality is what it is, but then when you show up, that expands the domain of apprehension and possibility in terms of that reality. And a huge amount of creativity and imagination lies inside of that, as well as emotional intelligence, so that you can actually read people's body language or faces and actually relate to people more appropriately because you're actually seeing them instead of just yourself and how they fit in in your life. So the repercussions go out. So I don't know if that was what you had in mind, but that's what arose. Uh, yeah, definitely. The problem I'm having is that I'd like to keep meditating. Keep... And uh, I've, yeah, I have, I have to ask you some more questions. But um, well, even that's amazing. I think a, a group of people sitting in silence for a few moments um, almost breeds this connection between people, even in the room, even though nothing's being said. 
you know, this sense of humanity, of shared humanity. Um, and maybe uh, I will follow up uh, on this practice that you did with us about what we just experienced about non-doing. Um, we were just sitting here, um, you know, listening, but in a different way than we would listen to a lecture or something like that. Um, and you've called non-doing a radical act of love. Yeah. And also, I think many people in the audience can probably relate to the fact that we're now living in a, you know, a society that's on overdrive all the time, that we have to-do lists, endless emails, <coughs> social media, professional advancement. Um, you know, even sometimes when, when we go on vacation, you know, we're trying to like maximize every experience. And just the process of, of just sitting and non-doing um, maybe has become more important than ever, you know, I would say for individuals and maybe for a whole society. I just would love to hear your comment on that. Uh, I second that emotion. Seriously. Um, yeah. I mean, we're almost like a species, a misnomer, you know, we should be called human doings uh, rather than human beings. But the being part really points to something that's infinitely close. That's the irony of all of this. Uh, I met with a group of people earlier and somehow out of the blue of my, you know, hippocampus came this wonderful quote from um, Henry David Thoreau in like the 1830s in Walden. He said, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if they could not teach me what I had to learn and not when they came to die, discover that I hadn't lived. So uh, each moment is precious and there's no guarantee that the next in-breath is going to actually happen. So there's a certain kind of, and I was pointing to that because, you know, it's dependent on the brain stem and the phrenic nerve and, and the diaphragm. I mean, I was joking that you know, you are not breathing because, like, you know, you breathe during your sleep. So you can't really say, I'm breathing. We do it all the time. You say, yeah, well, of course, who's breathing? Of course I'm breathing. Uh, but it's much more beautiful than that. It's much more mysterious. And it's a certain kind of way in which it's affirming that we're part of some kind of life unfolding on the planet, which is why it's worth studying biology at every level like it's happening here, because it's so unbelievably miraculous and amazing. I, you know, and I, I mean, you can riff on this endlessly, but the fact is, if we're moving into this region where time, where we're creating all these problems, planetary problems, and killing each other in more and more efficient ways over nothing, you know, okay, to be maybe friends I will, afterwards. I will use that um, maybe to get into my last question. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, it would be nice to take questions from the audience. But um, as part of the, you know, quote from, um, I believe, Mindfulness for, for All, you said, I don't know about you, but for myself, it feels like we are at a critical junction of life on this planet. And, um, you know, I, th I think uh, many of us in this room are here today also because they feel, they, they feel that way um, and see that in the world around us. And then you also write, it could go a number of different ways. It will be shaped by what we choose to do to heal the underlying distress, dissatisfaction, outright disease of our lives and our times, even as we nourish and protect all that is good and beautiful and healthy in the world. The challenge, as I see it, is one of coming to our senses, both individually and, a and as a species. So, John, you wrote that in um, 2005, um, and I wonder about... Just your, your comments on uh, what you wrote right now. Wow, it's... Uh, you 
know, when I, I started out and we're talking about MBSR, that was like to bring a certain kind of um, degree of meditative awareness into medicine. And the words medicine and meditation sound a lot alike. And there's a good reason for that, which we won't go into. And so MBSR and mindfulness, in some sense, the springboard for it moving into the world was medicine and medical science and the ex, you know the exponential uh, publication of studies about mindfulness showing really interesting things, but that's mostly orient towards me getting better, you know myself or you know sort of individuals. But there's another way in which uh, what you're pointing to is that like uh, we're. I like to sometimes think that you know if you think about the body and. I know at Janelia, you think a lot about the body. And <clears throat> uh, so there are more uh, cells in the human body than there are uh, stars in the, in the galaxy. You know, I mean, there's a lot of cells. And then if you think about atoms, like, you know, forget about it. I mean, it's like the mind can't even deal with that large a number. And yet we're also mostly empty space. So let's say that we're all cells of the one body politic of humanity, okay, or planet Earth, or however, because we're causing the most trouble. We're the ones that are causing the most trouble. And if we self annihilate, the cockroaches won't even notice. They will just be fine. They are evolutionarily adopted to just go another billion or so years without any problem. So the question is, Can we come to our senses? Uh, The title of that book. Can we wake up to the name that we audaciously, or Linnaeus anyway, gave gave us as a species, Homo sapiens sapiens? Okay, the the species that is aware. Sapere from the Latin means to taste or to know. So it's the knowing by direct apperception, not the knowing through thought. So Homo sapiens sapiens doesn't mean Homo cognition, cognition. It means homo awareness, awareness. Okay, awareness of awareness. Awareness and meta-awareness, if you want to put it that way. So uh, I, I sort of feel like it's almost imperative that our karmic assignment as a species is either we wake up to our true nature and discover ways to regulate our capacity for othering and hatred and for preferencing ourselves in ways that actually wind up harming everybody, including ourselves, or we're going to just kind of create endless and unimaginable levels of suffering, not just through wars and what's going on and, you know, everywhere on the planet, but you know where the inflammation points are at the moment and how insane it is. And at the same time... um, what's going on in terms of uh, the climate, which is just going to wind up oppressing virtually everybody and the poorest of people the most. So that's the challenge, and that's basically why I still do what I do, you know, that I feel like we've barely gotten started as a species to waking up to being fully human, and that that's the that's the challenge that we're all in, and we, I'm not doing it for myself. I have grandchildren, and I'm doing it for, like, you know, seven generations, as the Native, uh, you know, people speak of it, uh, that we need to take responsibility for the gene flow and the, the quality of life. I mean, why do we want to understand DNA and genes and, and you know, RNA and all of that stuff? I mean, we're like one pound smart and, uh, you know, sort of a ton idiotic. Uh, And so the brilliance of science and electron microscopes or everything else, why don't we bring that brilliance to at least tilt things in favor of uh, causing as much benefit in the world as possible and as little harm in the world as possible? That's something we can do. And that's what mindfulness is really about. Yes, uh, very well said, John. And I also do want to like tell the audience that you do this work um, for humanity, also with great hope um, and possibility for what we as humans and a species can achieve. 
So maybe I'd like to close with another quote of yours. Um, and here you say in, again, Mindfulness for All, human kindness and caring cannot die. Awareness and wisdom cannot die. They are in our DNA, often emerging even under the harshest and most nightmarish conditions. Each of us is capable of great love as well as unfortunately great harm to others and to ourselves, both in commission and omission. Why not nurture love? Why not nurture wisdom? Why not incline our minds and our hearts in this direction? After all, it is where real freedom and happiness lie. So John, um, I, I'd just like to close before we go on to questions. Um, you know, first of all, thank you uh, for coming. And you know, thank you for all that you have done. We didn't really have a chance to co- cover MBSR and the work you've done on chronic pain, but um, you've really relieved uh, a lot of suffering for millions of people. And um, I also hope that we uh, also heed your work um, of, of how we can you know, advance as a species um, for the good of, of, of the planet and mankind. And uh, um, you're an amazing role model for many people. And uh, we thank you for your work. So. Thank you. So we, um, we have time uh, for some questions for John. Or comments. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you have ever heard of Bernardo Castrop and his advocacy for the theory of idealism. And if you have, whether you have any comments about the conflict that is going on between those who advocate uh, theories of materialism versus those who advocate theories that consciousness is basic, that the, that the idealists advocate that consciousness is fundamental but, and not materialism. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you put your finger on one of my infinite number of points of total ignorance. So I can't really, <clears throat> I, I, much as I would love to, I just can't respond to your question at all because I have no familiarity with those formulations. But I love that you uh, care uh, about that. And, and since it sounds like it's a kind of this or that kind of question. Uh, I'm sometimes interested in taking this or that, the, this or that kinds of questions and doing a certain kind of Aikido on them where you get in close to the, to the dualism and see if there's not some other emergence that comes out of the synthesis that you're pointing to. I love these uh, these microphones that masquerade as boxes, <laughs> or boxes that masquerade. <clears throat> and do you throw them around? Are we they can. things you can toss them? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what do you do for uh, chronic pain? You mentioned something about uh, your chronic pain program. Well, there's the, it's a universe. Chronic pain. There's all sorts of different kinds of ways and that people experience pain, both emotional pain as well as, uh, you know, pain in the body. And, and it's amazing how little medicine has to offer past a certain point. And so the challenge is always, what could I do for myself that nobody on the planet can do for me, as I said earlier? And then when you start to actually do con- counterintuitive things, like instead of turn away from the pain, run away from it, actually turn towards it with awareness and put out the welcome mat, even for a fraction of a second, and just take a little peek at how it feels in that particular place. 
and then maybe breathe with it for a moment or two. So there are all these meditative strategies for actually befriending what you most want to just excise out of you but can't. And then it turns out that the brain, as I don't have to tell you folks, is unbelievably plastic. And that you can actually, this, these practices that look a lot like nothing, okay? I mean, if I were to just sit here for an hour, you know, people coming in from the outside at least didn't know what was going on. Said, Nothing's happening in here. But it turns out that this nothing, you know, like Shakespeare wrote a play called Not Much Ado About Nothing, uh, and it looks like meditation from the outside looks a lot like much you do about nothing. All this talk about mindfulness, 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 mindfulness. And I like to say, well, it's, it's, what you, it's much you do about what looks like nothing, but turns out to be just about everything. Because of the centrality of awareness and the potential universes that that opens up for us. And I like to think of it in the broad sweep of... Uh, uh, you know, at least from the Big Bang, because, you know, 18, the 13.8 billion years of evolution has given, first you needed to generate out of hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang, you needed to generate the 92 elements of the periodic table, right? I mean, you can't have life without, without iron, you can't have life without carbon, you can't have life without oxygen, nitrogen, and, and a lot of other elements. And all those elements came out of exploding stars. So, the, the, you know, it's like we have quite a history when you think about it from that perspective. And I love that, you know, well, I won't go into that. It's like, you know, once you get going on how amazing biology is or life is, but then let's not forget that we have hardly scratched the surface about how amazing we are. So when it comes to the untoward, whether it's chronic pain or you know, the body is just not what it used to be or anything like that. The real question is, how can I turn towards it and work with it as opposed to run away and try to excise it or get someone to, you know, fix it? Or, you know, when you discover that there are limited ways in which we can, like, you know, just restore you to how it was. But there, the book has not been written about how many different ways there are to embrace the actuality of things and then find some way to uh, accommodate uh, with self-compassion and with wisdom. And, you know, the shorthand for that is I have to learn to live with it. Uh, but, but the learning, that's a huge, you know, arc, and that's what this is about. Thanks for the question. I think there's a question over here. Question here. Yeah. So in terms of the like, overthinking and like you mentioned, the runaway mind, do you find that you can kind of just turn on uh, the uh, meditation at that point? You could mindfulness to, if I find myself getting into overthinking and I'm not, and I see like, you know, it's not very productive where I'm going with it. Well, what's your experience of that? Have you ever tried shutting off your mind? Yeah, yeah. I, how how, how successful is that? You just start thinking more things, or maybe last for a little while. But then okay, so that's a general out. principle. It's like the more you struggle with the mind or try to force it to be the way you want it to be, first of all, who, who's doing that? And it's more mind stuff, mm -hmm. and it's more selfing. And so I love that, you know, present participle. Selfing. We're selfing all the time, you know, and it's like, yeah. we don't have to do that. We could write ourselves a little restraining order. When we notice it, like, <laughs> just don't make yourself the center of the universe anymore. It's like, be, be a little bit more in your heart. Let it really be a radical act of love to take your seat, a radical act of sanity to drop into the present moment and then let awareness fill the body and let it fill your heart and see what's here when you stop shutting off certain aspects of experience or prefers, uh, prefer, preferring other experiences because you have some narrative that says this is squishy or you know not whatever. And just be in a discovery mode. I mean, that's what science really is. So like, what we're really talking about is like everybody becoming a scientist of the nature of reality and the nature of self and the nature of possibility, and for that matter, throw in healing. Why not? Um, another question? Okay. Um, 
Uh, um, hi, it's my. It's we, really my honor well, to this, have this chance. Maybe the last one, but last one. And yeah. so, as a actually a beginner of this concept of mindfulness, I actually have a pretty naive question, which is,、uh, what is the difference between the real meditation and the moment before I falling asleep when I was lying on the bed, shutting my mind down, like、uh, really thinking something to myself, and I can also feel the feel the air, feel the breathing. And do I do we really have to、uh, like take a gesture, take a gesture, and take this whole thing seriously? No, you don't have to take it seriously at all. <laughs> in fact, it's much better yeah, if you take it、meditation. with a big grain of salt. And then, in terms of like what the difference is between, say, formally, you know, taking some time to sit in the middle of your day, as opposed to what happens in that like twilight zone as you're drifting off to sleep, or Or in, I would suggest use that as your laboratory. If you want to know the answer to that question, check it out. And even more, in the morning when you wake up, how many of you wake up in the morning and say, "I'm I'm I'm up"? Anybody, anybody have that experience? Yeah. But is it true actually, or have you jumped out of bed on autopilot already and you're deep in thought? So why not? What I've started in my old age and dotage, recommending people meditate in bed because there's so many barriers to. Oh, if I have to get out of bed, it's like already.、Oh, <laughs> so okay, just lie down in your bed. You know, as soon as you say I wake up, see if it's true. Check. Am I really awake? I can feel your feet. Can you feel your feet? Can you feel your? Sensations in your hands. Can you feel the entirety of your body lying in what in yoga is called the corpse pose, the, hard, the hardest of all the hundreds of thousands of yoga postures. The hardest. Why? Because it requires that you die <laughs> to the past and to the future. You die to the past and die to the future. Oh, I look at the clock. I'm already late. No, you just in this moment, just lie in bed fully. Awake, then start your day. That's a, a a very sort of user friendly way to get into these practices. And then, if you keep it up, I can guarantee you that without reading any books about it or anything else, the meditation practice will show you everything that you need or want. Because the meditation practice is no different from looking in the mirror and asking that fundamental question. So we'll end on this. Where we started, what am I? Who am I? And then use that as like, you know, a love affair and a deep inquiry,、uh, and a big adventure. So I want to thank you for your attention t- tonight, folks. Thanks for coming. I also.、Uh... Want to say that we have a reception now um, for um, people that have joined us from our local community.、Uh, please also interact with、uh, scientists here at Genelia. I think a couple people, Monica, Samba,、um, Monica's over here, and Samba's over here,、um, specifically are are here to、um, interact with you and tell you more about Genelia. So. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy the enjoy the reception, and、um, again, thank you all for coming.、Uh, it's wonderful to host you tonight at at、uh, Genelia, and I'd like to give、uh, one last、uh, round of thanks and gratitude to John. I guess my microphone's no, it's not cut off. So、it's、I just want to say. In return, I can't help myself that you know,、um, you you have this amazing thing going on here, and it's just a true honor for me to come and and、uh, you know share in this sense of community. And I just really bow to you all, your whole community, for this.、Uh, it doesn't happen all that often in science that you know get this kind of.、Uh, Energy and engagement with a community, and it's it's very powerful. We think so too. <laughs> <laughs>